Welcome to STEM Talk. 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 Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is a man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hi, Don. Great to be here with you. So our guest today is Dr. Josh Turknet, a neurologist, musician, author, and entrepreneur. He has more than two decades of experience in the field of cognitive and behavioral neuroscience. So Josh practices medicine in Atlanta at the Turknet Center for Neurology and Cognitive Enhancement. He is the author of The Migraine Miracle and Keto for Migraine and has helped thousands of people use a holistic approach to end their chronic migraines. He is often referred to as the public enemy number one to migraines everywhere. So in today's episode, we talked to Josh about his own history with migraines and how migraine is a common and complex neurological disorder that includes a genetic component. Josh earned his bachelor's degree in cognitive neuroscience from Wesleyan University, an MD from Emory University, and completed his residency training at the University of Florida. In addition to his medical practice, Josh is also the founder of BrainJo, a company that creates educational resources that utilize a system of instruction based on the science of learning and neuroplasticity. He's also a musician who plays in the band the Georgia Jays and teaches people to play the claw hammer banjo, fingerstyle banjo, fiddle, and the ukulele. As if he didn't have enough to do, Josh is also the president of Physicians for Ancestral Health, the chief medical officer for Human OS, which was recently acquired by Restore Hyper Wellness, and is the host of the podcast Intelligence Unshackled, which explores many ways that the human potential has been constrained and how people might work toward optimizing it. But before Ken and I get to our interview with Josh, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we're especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker Dr. Pew. The review is titled, Informative Actionable Information. The review reads, I am a primary care physician, and this podcast is full of informative, valuable information. It is a wealth of recent scientific findings and data that can lead to actionable change for all of us. The Art Devaney interview was especially fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pugh, and thank you to all of our other STEM Talk listeners who've helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to our interview with Dr. Josh Turknet. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Talk. STEM Talk. Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Carnegas, and joining us today is Josh Turknet. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. And also joining us is Ken Ford. Hello, Don, and hello, Josh. Hey, Ken. So, Josh, as we mentioned in your introduction, you're a neurologist who specializes in treating people who suffer from migraines. And I understand that when you were growing up, your mom had frequent and actually ferocious migraines that she tried to hide from you and your brother. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So that was kind of my uh, first introduction to migraines, you know, watching her own struggle with it. And, you know, she was the kind of quintessential super mom you know, did everything. She worked full time, but also, you know, did everything for us Was a full time mom, you know, did everything around the house. We almost always had, you know, uh, meals cooked at home. And she was one who like very rarely did anything for herself. She had her one hour on Sundays that she would carve out to watch 60 minutes. And that was pretty much her main indulgence, you know, (laughs) the time that she would she had for herself. So, you know, I knew when, you know, these periods of time where she'd be taken out by a migraine that they had to be something pretty significant. And as a kid, it bothered me a lot because I knew, you know, it, it, it must be bad to, to see her like that. And of course, you know, as, as any migraine sufferer knows that there are going to be plenty of other times where you're trying to plow through the day and make it and, you know, carry out your responsibilities in spite of your pounding head. And, and so she would do that many days. And, and I kind of learned to, to recognize the, the look on her face that she had when, when that was happening. And, and um, I had this sort of spidey sense for knowing when she was uh, in that state and that was kind of the first, you know, 
my first negative experience with the migraine beast is is seeing her struggle with it and and watching how it could how it could impact her who you know was otherwise so full of energy and and um, could do so much. Mm. And you say that was your first experience and exposure to it. So how old were you when you first started to have migraines? So my first kind of uh, classic form of a migraine, uh, and I say that because children often have episodes that are that we now realize are kind of migraine equivalents, but uh, manifest differently. But the first time I had the kind of the what most people think of as a migraine with the full blown crushing headache, I was in sixth grade and I, I still remember it well. We were I was on uh, a bus coming back from a weekend trip with my class. And I started, you know, my started getting really nauseous, uh, head started pounding. And I can remember just laying on a seat in the bus, you know, with a, a bus full of uh, 11 year olds, you know, wishing they'd all be quiet about the about the worst place you can imagine for having a migraine. And I remember, you know, getting home, throwing up, going to sleep. And, you know, fortunately, it, 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 you know, after that, I was better. But, you know, I'm sure at the time, had I not seen my mom struggle with it, I probably would have thought something was seriously wrong. But I, I, I recognized kind of what was likely going on. And I also recognized that it was probably the um, bag of Doritos that I'd eaten uh, prior <laughs> to getting on the bus <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that did it to me. Oh, boy. That would put me right off Doritos. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> Later, we'll circle back to the professional work and research you've done on migraines. But first, I'm curious about how you became interested in science. We always ask our guests about this, and I'm told that there was a science project, I think it was in eighth grade, that had an impact on you. Could you talk about that a little? Yeah. So my first kind of academic interest, I was always into math. Uh, I love math. But the first real exposure to science, the first time it kind of planted a seed is this could be something I w- might want to devote more interest in was was in the eighth grade. And I did a, a science project there. And actually, the topic was on the advice of my mom. So she has a, a background in psychology. She was always interested in neuropsychology. So suggested a, an experiment based on the sort of investigating the lateralization of brain function, right? The right and left hemisphere. And, and um, so it involved giving different sorts of math problems with kind of different kinds of reasoning and logic to uh, either the the left or right ear of of my subjects. And so in doing that and researching that, you know, I learned, you know, some about of cognitive neuroscience and the brain. And that was kind of my first, you know, real foray into that area. And also, you know, the first time that I started kind of thinking about maybe pursuing science, you know, in, in my life. And then I had the good fortune to the next year, uh, in my ninth grade year, there was a program um, run by um, the Fernbank Science Center in Atlanta, where in, in your ninth grade year, you could spend an entire quarter with the scientists there, and you would rotate, uh, you'd spend a week or two, you know, a small group of, of students with them and in their labs. And so you could go from microbiology to, you know, astronomy, we got to do, we got to put on shows in the planetarium and, you know, work the telescope. And um, we got to do mass spec with chemistry, with the chemistry uh, there. And so it was just this great introduction to almost, you know, all of the physical and life sciences over a one to two week course. And um, that was also, A, the highlight of my kind of high school education, but also really another big influence in terms of steering me towards a, a career in science. It sounds like an incredible opportunity, Josh. And so how did you end up in the Northeast in Connecticut at Wesleyan University after you graduated from high school? So my mom had actually gone to Mount Holyoke College on a scholarship. Um, so she was from a small town in Georgia and went up there, which was pretty unusual, you know. She went there. So I was familiar kind of with the you know, Northeast small liberal arts schools and um, had thought, you know, I'd want to take a look at those when it was my time to go to college. So we did. And I, you know, particularly liked Westland. They have a, um, a real creative spirit there and a sort of embrace people who like to go off the beaten path or a little bit unconventional. And so I like that um, culture there. I think of, of all the liberal arts schools that I looked at, they were the only one that had a neuroscience um, degree, which was pretty unusual for any school back then. Um, I don't think there was maybe one other place that I'd looked at that had that. And so I didn't know, you know, at that point in time that that's what I was going to do. But I liked the fact that that was an option um, if I went there. So it was kind of the combination of those things, the fact that they had the, the neuroscience degree, but also I really liked the, the culture and the spirit there. So when you showed up on campus, you didn't know that you were going to major in neuroscience or was that in the back of your mind? 
So it was in the back of my mind. Uh, and and uh, interestingly, what, what happened was I was, um, so we had a, an orientation camping trip. That some I think some colleges probably still do this, where you go for a week before classes start and go on a camping trip with a group of, group of students. And one of the one of the people in my group uh, who became a close friend in college, we got to talking. I was, we were interested in the brain. He suggested er, he recommended um, the book "The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat" by Oliver Sacks. And so I went back to campus. Classes hadn't even started yet. I I checked out the book and read it, and you know thought this is you know this is incredible. I, I didn't at that point in time I had no idea what a neurologist was, but you know it was I was interested in cognitive neuroscience and. You know, here was this book about how you could apply that, help, you know, you solve puzzles every day by with, with, you know, seeing patients and then learn about the brain at the same time. And I thought that's, you know, really cool. So by the time classes had actually started, I was probably, you know, 90% towards deciding that I was going to major in neuroscience based on, you know, that experience and, and, and then thinking too, that I was going to carry that into uh, a career in neurology. So after spending four years in Connecticut, you decided to head back home to Atlanta to go to medical school at Emory. And I'm going to ask you, is it true that a girlfriend played a role in that decision? <laughs> uh, yes. So I'm originally from Atlanta. And my when I went off to college at Wesleyan, uh, my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, she was also going to school in the Northeast, um, but wanted to come back to Atlanta. So uh, I complied. That was uh, that was the that was one of the main reasons. Of course, Emory is a wonderful place to get medical training, but the fact that it was in Atlanta was also a big plus. So we actually going back to the the ninth grade program at Fern Bank Science Center. We actually got you know engaged when she was in her senior year of college, and she was in upstate New York. And then the following year, um, that's or that summer after she graduated, we got married at uh, the Fern Bank Museum of Natural History. And she had actually gone to that same science program. She was a year behind me in school, so we weren't there at the same time. But we had both gone there, so I loved the idea of getting married at a science museum. Yeah, yeah it's pretty. <laughs> that sounds pretty neat. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, it's cool that it all came back around that way. So, um, growing up, I hear that you were a staunch Gator hater, like most people in Georgia. So, what actually possessed you to attend the University of Florida for your residency? So it's true. I grew up a Gator hater, um, a, a Bulldog fan. So both of my, so my, uh, my grandmother uh, was a professor at UGA. My parents met in grad school at UGA. So I grew up, you know, a Bulldog fan. Um, but I was, uh, you know, at Emory for medical school and, um, you know, looking to go into neurology for my residency. And during my um, senior year, my fourth year of uh, medical school, Michael Oaken, who is at University of Florida now, he was doing his uh, fellowship in movement disorders and knew that I had, uh, he was doing a fellowship at, at Emory. And so we crossed paths there. And uh, he knew that I was uh, interested in cognitive neuroscience. And uh, he suggested that, you know, I check out University of Florida. He said they have you know, really good, good faculty um, in that area. And he was, I could tell, you know, super, he was super bright guy and sharp and clearly had had really good training and the kind of training that I wanted um, and, and particularly, you know, knowledgeable about behavioral neurology, which is kind of the clinical arm of cognitive neuroscience. So went and, you know, investigated that program and, and fell in love with it. And um, it ended up being an incredibly good decision. You know, University of Florida had at the time probably the best, in my view, best place to train in behavioral neurology, which is kind of dealing with um, disorders of cognition. And it was kind of like with the, the faculty, it, it felt like I was, uh, you know, if you're an aspiring composer and you get to sit down with, you know, Bach and Beethoven and Mozart every day and they say, you know, how can we help you? You know, that's, that's kind of the, the feeling it, that I had at um, being a, uh, a resident at University of Florida in, in that program. So having gone from kind of reading The Man Who Took His Wife as, for a Hat, you know, in, in freshman in college and wanting to do that sort of thing and then being at a program where I was being trained by people, the best minds in that field, it kind of felt like I'd died and gone to heaven. So I love, I love that program. I love, uh, I love the University of Florida because of it. Still can't bring myself to cheer for the Gators in football. Yeah, I, I can imagine that would be tough. <laughs> Plus, you'd have to do that goofy uh, sort of the, gator. Yeah, the, the gator. The chomp. The chomp. Or yeah, or right. Can't do it. Those, those childhood influences are pretty strong. You mentioned Michael Oak, and, and he's a friend of IHMC's, and uh, he was on STEM Talk episode 73, and uh, I commend uh, that episode to our listeners. He is indeed a sharp and engaging fellow. Definitely. So... 
could you talk a little bit about what was at the time highly touted, and that was a lot of excitement about the promise of neuroscience and neurology about when you were starting your training? And most of that has largely failed to materialize. In your talks, you often mention that the last major breakthrough in neurology was in the 90s with the discovery of tryptin, mm-hmm. drugs for uh, migraines. Have we really not made any advances since then, or major advances, or are they there and they're just not well recognized? I mean, what's your take on this? Yeah, so so when I, you know, part of part of the excitement of going into the field of neurology was that at the time it it felt like we were on the cusp of some major breakthroughs. We'd had you know lots of research in neuroscience. We'd had the decade of the brain. I recall, I've told this story before, that as a fourth-year uh, medical student, I asked one of the prominent Alzheimer's researchers at, at Emory you know, how long he thought it would be until we had a cure for it. And he you know, thought for a second and said 10 years. And that was kind of the prevailing thought at the time. It felt like it, you know, we were on the verge of some a breakthrough, and not just there, but in, in other conditions as well. And of course, as you know, most people probably know, that has not materialized. We don't, with respect to Alzheimer's, we don't have anything that's really incrementally better than what we had at the time I asked that question. So not only not a cure, but not a, a treatment that's better, you know, clinically. And that's the same thing has been true for the other major conditions in neurology and really broadly in, in medicine as well. We have things that, you know, maybe that have with kind of what we what we label as me too drugs, ones that, that work, you know, similar to existing ones, but that aren't replacing them as the gold standard. So most of the gold standards are still decades old and, and we don't have anything that would qualify as a breakthrough that's happened over the course of my career. And if you compare what the expectations were with the reality, I mean, it's pretty significant. And in my view, it, it should prompt us to kind of look, is there something wrong, flawed with the fundamental paradigm of how we're going about looking for solutions for the major diseases of our time, which are chronic multifactorial conditions driven heavily by lifestyle and environment. You know, question is, are pharmaceuticals or drugs the best type of treatment for addressing those? And mm. I, would, I would argue they aren't. Um, I do remember the excitement around the notion of the decade of the brain. Right. I think I was maybe an associate professor then around that level. And I remember uh, my colleagues that were neurologists or people interested in the field were very, very excited. Very excited. And it was at that point in time, it was kind of like the debate was mainly, is it going to be amyloid or is it going to be tau Mm -hmm. as the smoking gun? Right. (laughs) And it was like, we have to get this right or we'll we'll lose some time. But, you know, I would I would argue it's neither. We should stop looking for smoking guns. You know, when you think about this, uh, that exciting time period and, and you were in training and young, do you have any advice for current young folks in training in, you know, fields like neuroscience and neurology, what, you know, what would you say to them? Yeah. So I would say the, if I could, if I could go back and tell myself something, you know, what I've, what I've learned in terms of, you know, how I could have been more effective earlier, it would have been sort of adopting a more holistic um, systems-based type of approach to um, thinking about both, you know, the pathogenesis of the common conditions that we see and then also how we would go about best addressing them. And for me, the best explanatory framework that we have for understanding many of the conditions that we see commonly is mismatch. It's the mismatch between our present and our ancestral habitat. And to me, that's the best framework for unlocking the understanding of how what's happening. And it's also the best framework for understanding therapeutically what to do. So once I you know, personally kind of had that shift in my own thinking, that transformed what I was able to do for people. You know, it also made me realize that the system that I was in made it incredibly hard to actually implement that, right? And if you're in a system that it's, you know, choose the right drug as the name of the game and everything's kind of set up around that, it's really hard to, to deliver something, you know, fundamentally different systems-based type of thing. But the reality is, with rare exceptions, with clinical conditions that we see, it's almost never, you know, any one thing that's, that's doing it. And it's always all the things acting in combination. So really adopting a systems-based understanding of what's happening, I think it's critical to making progress in the major conditions that we face right now. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And, uh, you know, you see that when you see uh, people with backgrounds in engineering or computer science are looking at biological systems, they naturally take a systems view. Right. They almost have no choice mm-hmm. based on their training. And uh, you came to it 
naturally, I think through your experience and you started to see this pattern. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, I started, started to see that pattern and then, you know, that, that systems based approach was so much more helpful in terms of understanding and in terms of helping people. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, talking about migraine. Migraine is a complex neurological disorder that affects 15 to 20% of the population. And it's a complex disorder with various subtypes, including a genetic component. And in fact, your wife and both of your children suffer from migraines, as well as you and your mother, as we discussed earlier in the podcast. So what do we know about the genetic component? So like so many conditions, most conditions, uh, you know, migraines are, are a mix of kind of gene environment interactions. And it's one of those things where there have been sort of multiple blood genes identified that confer an increased susceptibility. So you have the, you know, the common phrase, genes load the gun and, and uh, environment pulls the trigger. And it's certainly true with migraine. So it definitely clusters in families. Um, however, there are plenty of people who suffer from them who don't know of family history of it. And it's thought, and I would, I would agree with this, um, that in, any brain is capable of having a migraine. And it's really just a matter of kind of the genes kind of set the threshold for what it takes to push you over that into it. So, you know, genes may make it you more environmentally susceptible than others. But it's with there are only there are rare syndromes that are more sort of autosomal dominant, directly genetic produce migraines. But the, the vast majority of folks with them sort of it's this complex interplay between gene, gene and environment. So the important thing there is that it's not your fate. You know, even if you do have a strong family history, um, we do know, you know, the, you can definitely uh, change the environment, change the lifestyle and make a dramatic impact on your course. When did you uh, decide this would be a real professional focus for you? I mean, I know you had had migraines and your family suffers migraines. You know, that's one thing. That's sort of a personal thing. But when did you decide it would be a professional focus? So it was kind of by accident. So as a neurologist, that is an area where who people, you know, are referred to for particularly cases of migraines that have gone, that are too complex for the primary care provider to handle. And so, you know, we have that expertise. But as I said before, my primary area of interest in neurology was cognitive disorders. And it wasn't until my own personal experience of changing my diet and lifestyle back in what is it, 2010, I think. And it profoundly and unexpectedly impacting my own migraines substantially that first that was kind of a wake-up call, right? Here I am an expert in migraines and I'd done something that, that had been far better than anything else that I'd ever done before by accident. Not, it, not, I wasn't expecting that to happen. So clearly there was some gap in my understanding of what was going on there. And so that's what led to me, you know, researching the whole ancestral health angle and nutrition in sort of a different way. And, you know, realizing that there was a lot more to the story that needed to get out there that, you know, I, I realized the impact that this, this was having not on me, but then on the patients I was using it with. So, you know, there was clearly a lot of people who could be helped by it. So it was uh, sort of uh, at that point became an obligation to begin sharing this story and sharing the new kind of insights that I had discovered from from my own personal journey and then the journey that I and the work I was doing with patients. Hmm. So a migraine is a cascade of events. And when triggered, this cascade prompts a variety of symptoms. And these include numbness, tingling, visual disturbances, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, fatigue, and of course, these blinding headaches that we've talked about. And it's hard, if not impossible, for people who don't have migraines to understand just how absolutely debilitating they can be. So when you try to explain to people what a migraine feels like, what do you say? So it's, it is quite challenging. It's one of those things that it doesn't feel like anything else. So it's, you can't really say, you can't compare it to this, you know. Um, it it's, doesn't taste like chicken. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and so it's also one of these things that, you know, probably uh, mercifully, you can't quite remember the intensity of the experience after it's over and it, for better or worse. But I think for me, the, the way that I've often framed it is, you know, you have and this speaks to part of the, the pathophysiology of, of migraines. You know, we know with, with certain drugs of abuse like heroin, they're sort of directly activating reward centers in the brain in ways that things in the course of your ordinary daily experience you can't, that are, that are not, you know, unnatural, so that are super normal type of stimulus, which is why they're problematic. So giving sort of pleasurable sensations outside of the bounds of what 
we can normally experience. And the same thing is happening on the other end of the spectrum with migraine. You have the migraine process turning on directly pain centers in the brain and then sort of starting this self-amplifying cycle where things continue to intensify over time. And so you have this sort of direct turning on the pain switch in a way that doesn't occur in the course of everyday life. So I think that's that accounts for why it is so different in the intensity, sustained level of intensity for so long that you don't really have any analog for, but much in the same way that kind of, you know, drugs of abuse are getting straight to the source, bypassing the usual way in which we experience pleasure. Same thing is happening with migraine. Mm -hmm. It's going straight to the pain centers um, and turning those on directly. Hmm. I have a friend who suffers from severe cluster headaches, hmm. and uh, he describes them as crushing, you know, debilitating. How do they relate to migraine? In, uh, in other words, is it a, are they thought to be related or is it in some way totally different? No, they are related. There are differences, but there's a lot of overlap. And they both appear to be um, started in the hypothalamus as, as the uh, center where they originate and um, cluster and probably why there's the clustering behavior to begin with, because you have the you know, hypothalamus regulating the circadian rhythms and other longer um, cycles that we have. So cluster headaches have very sort of predictable patterns, mm -hmm. and that's likely being generated by, by the hypothalamus. Um, so they, they overlap there in kind of their area of central origin, but then they kind of diverge in certain ways. Um, so there's overlap in things that work, but there are also things that work for cluster that don't work for migraine and oh. vice versa. I was going to ask you if the treatments were similar. Yeah. So there are some treatments that do work for both. And then some, so probably, you know, it depends on what arm of the physiological cascade you're targeting. Mm. You the know. lifestyle interventions work for both or? Yeah. In my experience, they do. And it's harder because of the nature of cluster headaches. Uh, the feedback from your interventions is a little harder to pin down. You can have people who have an attack once every two years. So it's hard to have a baseline to know if that you're impacting it. Whereas with migraines, if you have someone who's coming in and having them daily for years and you do an intervention, you know, it's pretty easy to understand whether or not that intervention helped or not. Mm -hmm. So, Josh, I understand that people start to feel the onset of a migraine anywhere between 4 and 48 hours before the actual pain sets in. And this is called the prodrome. So what is the prodrome and its symptoms? Right. So um, that actually gets to the, the hypothalamus as the origin. So migraines are divided into kind of four phases and the prodrome being the, the first phase. And it's not always experienced. And when it is experienced, it's not always recognized that it's part of the migraine, but it's something that can actually happen anywhere from 24 to 48 hours before the pain sets in. And the typical or the range of symptoms, it can be things like excessive thirst or feeling hot or feeling cold or feeling euphoric or feeling fatigued and depressed or excessively hungry. So the common thread there being these are all hypothalamic generated feelings uh, that we have, but they're being generated inappropriately, right? So they're being turned on when there's not a homeostatic need to do so. So you're feeling hungry when you don't need to eat or you're feeling you know, sleepy when you don't need to sleep and so forth. So that's one line of evidence that implicates the, the hypothalamus as a place where it begins. So you have those symptoms initially, and then again, lasting anywhere from 24 to 48 hours, and then the migraine sets in. Hmm. And then for some people, the pain of a migraine is preceded by an aura, which is often a frightening, but temporary neurological disturbance that sets off an alarm of an impending migraine headache. So what do we know about auras? So auras are these sort of tr temporary neurological disturbances usually last about 20 to 45 minutes. And so if we divide the four phases of migraine, they occur after the prodrome. And again, there's pretty much every possible combination you can imagine people can experience. So the, this is in sort of the most classic form, prodrome, and then followed by aura. But these, these are these temporary neurological disturbances. The occipital lobe is the most common place where they occur. They can occur any, in any part of the brain and been described everywhere, but uh, most commonly occipital, which produces visual symptoms. So the most classic form is kind of this uh, small flickering blind spot that starts out in the central area of vision in one field or the other, the right or the left, depending on what side of the brain is happening. And then it slowly expands over time. And the first person to describe uh, or to theorize about what was happening was a scientist, um, Leal, in the 40s. So he had migraines and, um, and had, had these auras and hypothesized that there was a wave of activity happening in the brain. And based on, so he measured the sort of how it spread over his, in his visual field and sort of back in the napkin calculation that it was spreading at a rate of about three millimeters per minute in the brain. 
since then, we've been able to, you know, look at these, uh, what's happening in the brain during during this phenomenon more carefully. And it turns out he was almost right on three to three to five millimeters per minute spreading. So what we think is the correlate of this, um, and there's pretty good evidence, is that you have this initial depolarization in the brain followed by hyperpolarization, and it spreads, it starts out in one spot and spreads out like a wave at this rate, three millimeters per minute. And then kind of that part lasts about 20 to 45 minutes. And that's, you know, what's thought to produce mm-hmm. the experience of aura. And so what part of the brain that wave is happening in is determines where, uh, what type of symptoms will be experienced. Is the aura that people describe with migraines, is that in some way similar to the experience that some people have preceding an epileptic uh, seizure? It's probably uh, physiologically different. It's similar in the sense that it's a, another type of warning symptom, you know, prior mm-hmm. to the to the to the main event, <laughs> right? But the spreading depression is that that phenomenon is unique to migraine. It's physiologically different. It's physiologically uh, different, right? After uh, a migraine and after the pain subsides. Mm-hmm. Do people bounce back quickly, functionally, cognitively, or, or is there a period of debilitation to some extent? Yeah, there's it, it typically, especially, you know, it's it's going to vary as a matter of degree. You know, how intense was the actual migraine? How long did it last? But there is a the, the force and final phase is known as the post So that's kind of the recovery period. So usually the most common symptom there is kind of an overwhelming feeling of fatigue. And lasts usually about a day. Occasionally, people will experience things like euphoria um, and, and other uh, symptoms. And it's hard to disentangle whether that's euphoria from your head not, <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'd be happy too. <laughs> yeah, so you're pretty, you're pretty ecstatic. You, it, the, the so one of the silver linings of migraines is you appreciate feeling normal so much more afterwards. But yeah, there's this postdrome, and it's you know, there's massive sort of neurotransmitter and, and electrical chemical shifts that have happened during the during the migraine, and sort of the, the brain is recalibrating and, and and getting sort of back to baseline during that period. That's probably what accounts for at least part of the experience of the postdrome. So you don't you don't feel like your normal self until, you know, at least a day or so later. Hmm. So we want to talk about how diet and lifestyle can help people manage their migraines. But first, I want to talk to you about your interest in ancestral health, which you've kind of touched on a little bit already. And I understand it was around 2010 when you first started looking into ancestral health. And this is also around the time when paleo, and this is a term that some of us dislike, <laughs> was beginning to become popular. So how and why did you become interested in an ancestral way of eating? So yeah, I, I, I agree as well. Uh, it was during the time when sort of paleo was was there a lot of interest in that. Um, I also don't love the term anymore, but um, like so many things, it started out kind of a surfing the web one day. I think it was uh, my brother had sent me an article by a radiologist, Kurt Harris. The actual article itself was, I think, on coronary calcifications and and marathon runners. But it was really. Uh, really well written. So I read more of his stuff and he was, he was advocating, you know, he, he was writing a lot of stuff on paleo ideas and low carb. So um, he had recommended Gary Taubes' book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. So after, you know, reading his stuff and, and then I ended up reading Good Calories, Bad Calories. And kind of with that, the, probably the, the biggest takeaway there was that, you know, the, the ideas that I and so many of my colleagues had around diet there were some holes in that story, uh, particularly around the ideas around uh, fat. And so that's what kind of kicked off my sort of reassessment of, of nutrition and the ideas that I had about it. And ultimately kind of primarily as a way of reconfiguring my own life in, terms, in, a, in, a, in a healthier fashion to sort of resolve the cognitive distance that I now had between the way that I thought was a sort of a healthy eating pattern to and what I now realize probably was, was more of one. So I changed my own diet and lifestyle. And it was in doing that, that surprisingly and, and unexpectedly, my migraines, which prior to that, I probably had about 60 days out of the year where I had to take something wow. um, to, to, to relieve them. And I still remember six weeks after making these changes, I remember walking in the lobby of the medical building where I was at and thinking, I haven't taken anything in six weeks. And I remember calling my wife and saying, and telling her this. And I think, I was like, could it be this, you know, this change that I made in my diet, you know? And, you know, turned out that in the following year, I only took something one time. So that was 
that was the spark that first said, okay, there's something clearly missing in my understanding of what's going on here and what, and our understanding of what's going on. And that led me to looking into the people in the low-carb community and so forth, realizing that many others with migraines had had a similar experience and then using it with patients and then ultimately that, you know, transforming into writing the book and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it was your person, it was mostly your personal experience that led to writing the book uh, about the migraine miracle that came out in 2013. Were there other discoveries that sort of stimulate you to write the book or was it largely based on this experience you've just described? Yeah, so that was that was definitely the the thing that, you know, kicked it all off. And then it was looking around to see that there, I wasn't I wasn't alone in having this experience. And then it was starting to use it with patients who were receptive to the idea of that kind of change in diet and lifestyle, seeing it work there and realizing that this was not, you know, a unique experience. You know, ultimately realizing that this was information that that needed to get out there to a broader audience uh, because it could be so helpful. And so felt like in some ways obligated to to write the book about it. And then since then, we've built a community around that book and, you know, have been able to help thousands of people internationally with this. And, you know, many of whom spent decades with chronic migraines, you know, on every medication, you know, the hardest cases of all and doing this and are now migraine free. So it turned out to be, you know, I was able to do more writing that book and starting this community and putting this information out there and, and, and helping people and figuring out a way to help people implement it than I ever would have been with the tools and resources that I had in the clinic. Yeah, that's, um, it's great that you did that because you helped, as you said, a lot of people. And so often interventions like that that can be incredibly helpful are resisted because the whole system is set up for drug testing and they're looking for RCTs. And if you had waited to do that, you'd still be waiting. 100%. And, uh, you know, I've come to the point of view where in many ways I think that that reliance on that solely on that method of research has actually been quite harmful. Uh, yeah, I would concur. And one of the things that I've been arguing for you know, since this experience, since realizing that ancestral health was such a powerful tool is, you know, we, we need to figure out other systems for advancing knowledge uh, of that. Or the RCTs are not the way to do it. These are flexible, uh, adaptable, customized, individualized types of interventions. And you can't, you can't advance knowledge on that with an RCT. It's not the right way yeah. to do it. And can you imagine doing RCTs in most of the rest of science? Right, right, exactly. You don't do them. No. Yeah. Right. So it's this. It's and it's it's useful in certain domains. It is right, but it's an it's as a constraint we should not be applying in other way in in other areas, and and it's really harmed us in being able to uh, implement lifestyle interventions. So it's we've we've created this. It's it's the only way to vet new therapies, but yet the therapies that I, that I argue are most powerful can't be vetted that way. So we've we've created this paradox where. If we want to advance the, these types of interventions, we don't have a system for doing it. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. So the ketogenic diet has become extremely popular over the past five years, and many people are drawn to this diet because of its effectiveness in terms of weight loss. But as we know, and as we've talked about a fair bit here on some talk, there are other benefits too. A ketogenic diet has been shown to be an effective way to deal with epileptic seizures, metabolic disorders, and a lot of other health issues. But until your book, Keto from migraine came along, there weren't many references to how a low-carb, high-fat diet could help people control their migraines. So what led you to start looking into this? There was kind of a convergence of interest in, in the past decade. You know, you had the, the paleo movement, and then you had around that keto, you know, a lot of people starting to realize that, that the ketogenic diet was another kind of powerful tool. And all of that was kind of facilitated by us sort of relaxing our ideas about dietary fat and realizing it wasn't the boogeyman that we'd made it out to be. So that kind of opened the doors, you know, I think in a lot of ways for exploring these these ideas. But it turns out 
for, you know, so the, with, the neurologists have been familiar with the ketogenic diet for a long time because it's been used in, in refractory cases of uh, pediatric epilepsy. But even for that, even though it's, it, you know, helps in these severe cases where drugs don't, so it's a powerful intervention, it was always viewed as a last resort because it was thought to be dangerous because it required eating more fat. And the, the you know, the, the diets that were used weren't, weren't particularly well formulated, but it was still, you know, this thing that you would only, it's considered an extreme measure. Um, but it turns out they were actually, uh, the first study of ketogenic diets for migraines was in the early 20th century. And it was, po- it was positive and then, you know, disappeared altogether, as did a lot of any research with keto. And it wasn't until kind of the doors reopened um, recently that now it's, it's being re-explored. So we, we lost a lot of time there. But, but I realized that when I'd, when I'd initially changed my diet, that not only was I eating kind of an uh, ancestral whole foods diet, it was also probably keto for much of the time. So I began specifically exploring the um, use of keto myself first. And then, you know, that's kind of been the, my um, approach has been exploring new, new ways of doing things uh, on myself and then starting to use them with, with others. So there's, you know, both empirical and sort of mechanistic theoretical reasons why a ketogenic diet would work for migraines. There's lots of overlap between migraine and seizures or epilepsy. So not unreasonable that they would uh, be helpful for both. So began using it uh, with others as well. Realize it's another kind of arrow in the quiver that we have that we can that we can use in addition to the other sort of lifestyle and, and diet changes that we make. And that it's it's been sort of for 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 many a real breakthrough uh, and can kind of accelerate their improvement and their recovery and sort of a something they can keep in their back pocket if needed to sort of hit the reset button. So yeah, it's been uh, it's been really effective for me as a tool clinically, and thankfully now there's uh, research again on it for migraine. It was the first kind of trial published, I think, in 2019, um, showing some pretty impressive results. So yeah, I think I think it'll be used more and more. Um, but one of the reasons I wrote the book Keto for Migraine was you have the it became such a popular thing. People were hearing that it was useful for migraines and would start to use it, but would oftentimes kind of go on the the pop version of keto, um, which you know another reason why a holistic approach matters is it's not you know it's not just about the ketones, right? There's always more more things to consider. So um, people would would go on the pop version of keto and may, may not see results because they know they were doing things that would undermine migraines in the way they were implementing it. So I've felt there was a need to, to put something out there that was that f- used what I learned in using keto for, for people with migraines uh, so that they wouldn't go down that path or that folks who were implementing it for things like weight loss but also had migraines wouldn't be worsening their migraine condition and not getting the benefits from that standpoint as well. So you talk about how the typical version of keto can make migraines worse. So what are the keys for maximizing the benefits of keto for for migraine? Yeah, so um, I think the biggest issue that people run into is sort of substituting one processed-based diet with another. And the approach that I use and, and recommend with folks with migraine is sort of grounded in the ancestral diet as the framework and then, you know, adapting that for keto. So when you're doing that, you're sort of sticking with macronutrient uh, ratios uh, that are still found in nature. The issue that typically arises when folks adopt other ways of eating uh, keto is that they end up, you know, with ratios not found in nature or fat bombs or things that are maybe tolerated by by those without migraines, but uh, can be uh, problematic for those with them. So kind of substituting one problem for another. Hmm. So there are people that shy away from ketogenic diet because it elevates their LDL cholesterol. Can you address how ketosis impacts blood cholesterol testing? Yeah, so the uh, vast majority of the people that uh, I've worked with in terms of how they respond or how their um, blood lipids respond to a ketogenic diet is, and myself included, is we typically see a modest rise in LDL cholesterol, we see a more significant rise in HDL cholesterol, and then we see a drop in triglycerides, which is usually the most, uh, the, the biggest effect. So in totality, if you, if you look at the, that response, that would be a favorable trend in ter- if you're looking at the prediction of cardiovascular risk, which is, you know, the main reason we care about lipids, right, is in terms of their ability to predict cardiovascular risk. And the only thing there that's trending in the other direction would be the, the rise in LDL, which is typically less than, than the other markers. 
But even within that, if you then do advanced lipid testing and break that down, you're going to typically find that that increases because your particle size has increased. So your uh, your pattern is is going to be is almost always the the favorable pattern of large fluffy LDL particles rather than lots of small dense ones. So all of that, the lipid markers with the typical person on keto are trending in a positive direction. And then you add on top of that what we usually see with things like blood pressure and weight you know, all of those things are moving in a direction that would clearly be associated with a reduction in cardiovascular risk. So in totality, not only do I not worry about cardiovascular risk, I think it's beneficial, you know, sure. from the standpoint mm-hmm. of, of cardio protection. And it's really the, the unfortunate part about it is in medicine, it's almost become exclusively about LDL in so many doctors' minds. Yeah, it's, it's just it's, all they focus on. It's beyond ridiculous, yeah. actually. They're, you know, rather than worrying about whether this person actually has heart disease, <laughs> right. they're worried about this number, which is not the same thing as having heart disease. Absolutely. You, you know, it's it's very troublesome. Mm-hmm. There's um, one small group, as you probably know, of people that go on keto, small but not insignificant, that end up with really massive elevations of LDLP. Mm-hmm. What nobody knows is what does that mean in a population that's ketogenic? Right. That's an open question, right? It, we in, it, like we talked about four context is everything, right? So what does that what does that mean? It, it probably means something very different in someone who's has that elevation in a standard Western diet, but you know, still don't know. So what have you learned? And this could be things that you surmise through informed conjecture, and it could be things you've actually learned about ketosis and the mechanistic effect on a brain experiencing migraines. Right. So obviously one of the things we'd like to know is why is a ketogenic diet helpful for migraines? Why is it helpful for epilepsy? Why is it, you know, all these different uh, brain conditions where it's showing promise? And the answer is we still don't know. And it's a challenging question to get at, number one, because migraines are complex pathophysiologically. There's a lot, you know, a lot of moving parts. And you also have a lot of things changing with a ketogenic diet. You have the ketones being produced, but you have a lot of other things that are also happening. And then you have the fact that our ability to understand, to, to analyze that in humans is limited with how sort of granular we can get in, in, in it. But um, I'll say that the, uh, so there are multiple possible mechanisms by which ketones could be suppressing, you know, migraine or, or reducing vulnerability to migraines, some of which may relate to how they're also doing that with epilepsy. There is a theory right now of migraines as a reaction to oxidative stress. And there's evidence so that, that there's mitochondrial dysfunction in migraineurs. So that's one. So if, you know, if migraines are in part a reaction to oxidative stress, that's one avenue by which ketones may be helping both through mitochondrial biogenesis and uh, so forth. They can, and, and other mechanisms, improve with both the amount of reactive oxygen species generated, but also in our capacity to deal with them. So you may be simply reducing oxidative injury in the brain in migraines, and that could be one way by which um, ketones are work. But one of the things that the important things I think clinically that I've learned in working with people and another sort of reason for taking the holistic view is to understand that it isn't. It's, it, it, even if you know ketones are part of the reason why it works, it's not going to be the entire reason why a ketogenic diet is beneficial for my, for migraineurs. It's likely multiple different things that are happening, including simply the reduction in refined carbohydrates. Right, that that alone is going to be beneficial for someone with migraines. So I try to keep people from becoming too obsessively focused on the ketones themselves, understanding that just simply adopting this particular pattern of eating is beneficial for many different reasons. And we're still learning the reasons why. And, you know, part of it may be the ketones, but they don't, you, re, we know that people will benefit regardless of how much time they're spending in ketosis. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the ketones themselves have many roles other than just fuel. And, and so people are so focused on the fuel aspect and right. they tend to underthink about all of the other functions, such as signaling. They almost act like a hormone in right. many cases. Right. And then in the brain, they potentiate GABAergic transmission. So Lots they have of stuff. Yeah. So. Good answer. Thank you. As you are absolutely well aware of, there's lots of ways to get into ketosis, at least, you know, three or four. And uh, the traditional way for most of uh, human experience is we don't have enough food. Mm -hmm. So, you know, starvation is the most common way over human history. And uh, this leads us to talk about fasting. Mm -hmm. 
And I wonder if you use fasting with your patients and, uh, and uh, how that's received and uh, has it worked well? Yeah, so it is another promising area and a promise, another promising tool. I think both from um, a preventative and actually uh, an acute standpoint. So one of the things that I've discovered and that many others now are now using is that in the course of a migraine, fasting will shorten the duration and eating tends to prolong it. So fasting, um, I now use personally, and many of the people I work with do as well as what we, you know, an abortive tool, j- just just similar as you would take a medication at the onset of the, if you, you know, have a headache um, or a migraine that's evolving, fasting as a way of shortening the duration as much as possible. And, you know, mechanistically, there are, again, multiple possible ways that that could be beneficial, including, you know, the, ultimately the generation of ketones. But that has been tremendously effective, especially considering that one of the big issues that people face with migraines is that the drugs that work best for aborting them, for ending an an attack, make the condition worse over the long term. So you trade this short-term benefit with them increasing the likelihood that they're going to return. So it often transforms them into a much more chronic problem. So you have a need for some tool other than a drug to end an attack. And that's where fasting has been so helpful for so many people I work with. What tends to happen there is that eating tends to prolong the duration of the attack and it seems to be worse you know that that's most intense if you know refined carbohydrates are involved with that versus eating protein or something that's non sort of insulinogenic or um, tends to be the least effect um, but fasting just period is what I advocate you know unless it's an extreme circumstance for for a long number of days but just having that awareness that adding food into the system adding energy will tend to prolong an attack has been extremely helpful for people so that's on the acute side and then chronically a lot of the people I work with use intermittent fasting I think that you know independent of the of the nutritional ketosis issue is that metabolic flexibility in general seems to be really beneficial for migraineurs and we often see people make a breakthrough when they kind of hit that mark where they're becoming more metabolically flexible and they can, they're experiencing that in other ways as well. And so fasting can be sort of another tool to help enhance the machinery involved with that, as well as, you know, enhancing the, the transition to keto. Hmm. So it's interesting how quickly fasting has again become popular, even though it was the rage in this country more than a century ago. And the journalist and novelist Upton Sinclair even wrote a best-selling book in 1911 called The Fasting Cure. So as a little bit of an offshoot, I understand that you read the book and discovered some really interesting things about Sinclair. Yeah, um, another one of those, there's nothing new under the sun things. Um, uh, Just like, you know, keto had been discovered in the early 20th century, you know, I look at Sinclair's book and and one of the things he talks about over and over again is is suffering from chronic headaches that had continued to escalate and were becoming increasingly debilitating. And, you know, he goes on and on about in in the book about fasting and the fact that, that miraculously, you know, he was no longer having headaches with these prolonged fasts. And apparently, you know, that was one of the things when it was a fad, that was one of the things people were recognizing as one of the benefits is it was ending their chronic headaches. And, you know, one of those other pieces of knowledge is like keto that we kind of lost for a while. The Romans, uh, I mean, they essentially applied a form of keto to epilepsy. When uh, kids had the seizures, they were secluded in a safe padded place with water, but no food. Mm -hmm. So they didn't feed them Mm -hmm. and the seizures often stopped. And of course, these kids were going to ketosis. Right. And, um, you know, it's amazing, as you said, there's sometimes nothing new under the sun. We find different ways to describe the same thing or we learn more about the mechanism at hand Right. But, uh, you know, humans have been around a long time. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of stuff we figured out <laughs> a while back. Yeah. You only have to walk around uh, a place like Rome and think, this building was here 2,000 years ago. There's not a single thing we build now that's going to be around even 1,000 years, <laughs> right, even 500 true. years. Yep. So, Josh, you've investigated the possibility that there's a connection between migraines and gut health. Recently, it seems there's been a multitude of disorders associated with a breakdown of the gut barrier. What can you tell us about any possible connection between migraines, the microbiome, and gut health more generally? Yeah, so it's common to refer to the gut now as the second brain. So not surprisingly, there's lots of connections between the gut 
and migraines. And interestingly, speaking to what we were just talking about, just the other day, I was reading that a thousand years ago in Persia, uh, there was a physician there who described all of these different headache syndromes and the different digestive symptoms that accompany them and w- specific treatments for what to do for each of them. Um, and so and so recognize all the way back then that there's this tight link between gut, the, the health of the gut and, and sort of propensity for headaches and migraines. And so nowadays we know that sort of works in both directions, having a condition that affects the gut and especially ones that involve some breakdown in, in gut permeability. Uh, there's a significant increase in the likelihood of migraines in those folks and vice versa. People with migraines are much more likely to have some sort of digestive issue or gut condition. So things like celiac for one is a big significant increase in risk of migraines with celiac um, as well as inflammatory bowel disease. And one of the ways of kind of thinking about migraines in general is is a sort of a heightened um, sensitivity to the environment. And of course, the, the gut is, is one of our primary interfaces with the environment. So things that getting in that shouldn't get in and even access to the brain via breakdown in the blood-brain barrier getting in um, probably are part of the migraine story. So there's lots of evidence there that there's a link between the breakdown in, in the uh, gut barrier and migraines, and maybe even the kind of the lead domino in the pro- in the process. Um, I think there's there's enough to to think that's a, a very plausible idea, and I think that's probably a plausible idea in other diseases of civilization that their that their initial sort of entryway is, is via gut and systemic inflammation, and and then all that comes from that. But certainly. The the other sort of piece of evidence that strongly links them is that in these conditions, in these gut disorders where there is a link between an increased likelihood of migraine, treating the gut condition typically leads to a significant improvement in migraines. And that's what was noted in that document a thousand years ago, that if you heal the gut, you help the headaches too. And we've I've definitely seen the same thing with people I work with. So, you know, again, going back to the idea of a holistic approach, you know, have to be mindful of all of these different arms that are that are affecting someone's health and some, someone's uh, vulnerability to migraines. So the gut uh, receives a lot of attention from me and, and with uh, the people I work with. So in addition to your medical practice and working with people with migraines, you're also a musician, an entrepreneur, and a business consultant. And also in 2020, you published not one, but two books. And you are the current president of the Physicians for Ancestral Health, which is actually a role previously held by Tommy Wood, who is an IHMC researcher and also has been on several of our podcasts. So in terms of your music, you play banjo and sing for a wonderful band called the Georgia Jays. So how do you juggle everything? <laughs> uh, copious amounts of caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so I think that it's one of those things, outwardly, it probably seems like I'm doing all of these somewhat disconnected um, things in my life. And so if you if you kind of view things from the traditional ways we kind of parse our endeavors or, or categorize the world, it seems like a lot of different hats. But for me, my primary aim is, you know, I have a set of problems that I find that I think are interesting that are also lined up with my areas of expertise. I have a set of ideas that I want to promote and share. And the project then is figuring out the best place for those and the best best way to, you know, make, how, how can I make the dent in the universe that I want to make? And, wh- you know, what's the best place to package that? And so for me, on the, on the inside, it's, it's working on the same sort of things, but just using kind of different tools. So from that standpoint, it's a little more unified and less fragmented than it would seem, mm-hmm. you know, looking at, you know, doing neurology today and doing writing today and music tomorrow, you know, from the sort of those categories, it looks juggling a lot. For, for, for me, it's kind of there, there are unifying threads and probably the biggest unifying thread is that helping realize human potential by applying neuroscience. And that's kind of regardless of what area I'm working in, that's, that's the unifying thread amongst it all. And it's kind of, kind of you know, in many ways, I think similar to the to IHMC, if you look at the, from the outside, you see robotics, you see AI, you see extremes of human performance. Um, those can feel disconnected until you realize the underlying thread, you know, is augmenting human intelligence and performance and, and the human experience. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So quick side question, how long have you been playing the banjo and what can you tell us about the Georgia Jays? So uh, I got my first banjo my intern year 
of residency. So I had um, played a little guitar prior to that. My brother, who's, who's a musician, knew that I had said before that I really liked the sound of the banjo and wanted to play it one day. And so he and my family it gave me a banjo for Christmas that year. That became a great respite during my um, residency training. And I really just fell in love with it then. And so I've played in a few different band configurations over the years. And uh, the most recent one is, is the Georgia Jays, where I, uh, I play with a fiddle player, um, Justin Manglitz. Um, so we've been doing that for a few years. It's really good, too. I, en- I enjoy your music quite a bit. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Do I understand, too, there's a, a whiskey component huh. as well? To the Georgia Jays. So yeah, so so Justin is uh, the uh, head distiller for American Spirit Whiskey. Okay, and he's actually the the most decorated whiskey distiller in the world over the past five years. So hmm. he's his they've won he's won uh, six double golds at the San Francisco distillery competition or whatever, which is an international thing. And and yeah, so he's he's a master fiddler and a master distiller. Yeah. M- multi talented across the board for the Georgia yeah. Jays. <laughs> So, so in addition to Keto from Migraines, the other book that you wrote last year was The Laws of Brain Joe, which is a compilation of articles about the fundamental principles of learning. And you describe the book as a neuroscience-based system of instruction for learning, as well as an owner's manual for molding a musical mind at any age. So can you give us an overview of the Brain Joe system? Sure. Um, so... Brain Joe is kind of the uh, is a is an idea that was had been in my head for for a long time, and in retrospect and looking through my life, I've been kind of addicted to the learning process and addicted to neuroplasticity, kind of for as long as I remember. There's just the um, joy that comes from getting better at something and and marveling at what's possible, you know, what we can do that seem would seem just you know out of reach if we just you know stick with something. So, and and one of the things that always bothered me growing up was that I knew that my results and whatever it was, if it was a sport or, you know, uh, anything else were directly linked to the, to the effort that I put in and the amount I practiced and not just how much, but, but kind of how I practiced and that these things mattered. And yet that didn't seem to be reflected anywhere. And almost always the, the narratives around that were that this was, you know, you, you were good at something because you were born with it. And when people would say things about basketball, nobody would ever ask how much I pre- would ever say, like, you must practice a lot, you know. So that, that always, you know, stuck with me and, and bothered me that this idea that you, we get better at things through, through our efforts and that the quality of those efforts also mattered. That was always kind of something in the back of my mind that, that nagged at me, and I wanted to try to help change that narrative. And then, you know, as I began a career in the neurosciences, you know, realized that there was sort of a, a scientific foundation for a lot of the principles that I, you know, kind of in- discovered empirically in, in trying to, you know, improve at things and realized that those two things could talk to each other that we could, uh, by sort of blending what we were learning on the theoretical side about the principles of learning and neuroplasticity, and then what we've learned on the empirical side about how to get better at something, that those, you know, those things can be complementary and should be informing each other. And so that's kind of the basic idea of, of Brain Joe is sort of taking the best of what we know in the realm of developing expertise, as well as of what we know about the mechanisms of neuroplasticity to try to design a best framework for learning anything. And one reason that I've applied this to music is because it's an area where the ideas about innate abilities and where the fixed mindset is still pretty prevalent. And it's also an area where the feedback cycle is very short um, and there's kind of a high ceiling of, of ability. So it's a great domain for testing ideas, but it's also a great domain for people proving to themselves that these things work. So if you're looking to sort of divorce people on an individual level about ideas, about innate talent and so forth, then it's a, a really good domain for doing so, even though the principles that are there in many ways will apply to learning uh, on any uh, particular uh, domain. But yeah, it's kind of the fundamental idea that I want to advance and use the system of instruction as a way of kind of demonstrating it to folks is that our success in learning anything is almost exclusively driven by process rather than aptitudes. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating. We are recording your interview this morning following your lecture at IHMC last night. And by the way, it was a great talk, Josh. Everyone loved it. You talked about how the significant reduction in cognitively demanding activities that typically does occur over a human lifespan 
may be a driving force in the development of cognitive decline and even dementia. You refer to this as the demand-driven decline theory, and you discussed how activities such as brain games and other activities can help us reduce the age-related cognitive decline that we all are so concerned about. And listeners can view your video of your talk last night on iHMC's website or on YouTube. It'll be up by the time this comes out. Can you touch on demand-driven decline theory and on the key points that you made last night? Sure. So, as most people probably know, there is uh, a body of research now that has indicated that a cognitively active lifestyle is associated with a lower likelihood of, of cognitive decline and dementia. And, you know, one of the questions there is, how is that working? Kind of the prevailing idea has been uh, is referred to as cognitive reserve, uh, and the the basic concept there is you know you leading a cognitive active lifestyle sort of creates uh, redundancy in the system or lots of different representations of knowledge in the brain so that it's more resistant to degradation. So if you have a you know an insult or injury or, or disease process affecting a particular area of the brain, if you have other areas representing that piece of knowledge that you have that's generated by having an active lifestyle, learning a lot, then you'll be the functional impact will be less. But with the demand-driven decline theory, there's another mechanism that appears to exist in the nervous system in the brain, which also exists elsewhere in the body, in the musculoskeletal system, cardiovascular system, which is that activity doesn't just create, you know, backup systems, but actually restores the health and integrity and function of our existing system. So, you know, just as you can lift weights to grow muscles and, and improve the health of the musculoskeletal system, uh, there's evidence that you, the same thing is happening in the brain. So, and I refer to this phenomenon as demand coupling, where, where the, the health and function of a tissue is coupled to the demands that we place on it. And we know that this works in both directions. So the less we do, tissue can degrade even to a maladaptive point. Uh, and we see this clinically with a phenomenon known as hospital-associated deconditioning, where just simply immobilizing someone in the hospital causes these widespread multisystemic physiologic deteriorations. And, you know, it's being driven by just doing nothing. So again, that's, you know, we have demands being coupled to the health and integrity of a tissue. So how much our body decides to take care of something is in part driven by the demands that we place on it. So once you kind of recognize that that system, that that phenomenon exists in the brain, then you realize that, you know, a drop in cognitive activity can lead to tissue deterioration. And we, you know, in the course of a typical human life, we have these extraordinarily high cognitive demands in childhood. You know, we're developing the three you know, most sophisticated capabilities that most of us develop, talking, walking, and socializing. And then we also concentrate all of our, a lot of our complex learning in early life. And then we typically, you know, we think of adulthood as the time we kind of put into effect the skills and things we learned as, in, as children. So we have a pretty significant drop in the demands over the course of a human life, and that tends to fall off even further as we hit retirement age. So if the health and, and function of nervous tissue is coupled to the demands we place on it, then that we would predict to cause tissue deterioration. So that drop in demands, which also mirrors the course of what we typically see in terms of cognitive function over the lifespan, we typically see it declining around the third or fourth decade, which is also happens to, you know, the time shortly after our demands start to drop and then accelerating in later life. So again, that would fit if, if, if that phenomenon is in part driving that process. So that would mean that even if we're doing things to support brain health and function, if we don't have that strong repair signal, those efforts you know, may not be impactful. And so the, the basic idea is that that, that reduction in, in cognitive demands over our lifespan is a key factor in driving cognitive decline and dementia. And that addressing that may be, if we want to find solutions for that, for these conditions, that addressing that may be a necessary component of that, hmm. um, that um, pr process. It's really interesting. So a previous guest on STEM Talk, Dr. Dale Bredesen, has actually proposed a multimodal model that includes things like toxic exposures and stressors and diet genetics, hormonal effects as drivers of cognitive decline that need to be individually assessed and addressed based on the patient. And in his model, the capacity of the brain slowly decreases over time as the injury accumulates until supply of cognitive function no longer meets the demand. 
And your model potentially suggests the opposite, where demand is first reduced over the lifespan as adults do fewer and fewer cognitively difficult processes as they specialize in work and then and then they retire. So in this model, the brain then reduces capacity to match this reduced demand, which causes long-term reductions in cognitive function. And there's evidence to support both models. So how do you think they could be reconciled? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, and I don't see these two things as mutually exclusive, but complementary. And, I, and I'm a fan of, of Bredesen's work because, you know, he's addressing, it, recognizing the fact that Alzheimer's and cognitive decline is a multifactorial condition and that any treatment of it is going to need to be flexible and adaptive and customized and, you know, attend to all the things that are happening there. So I think the best way to think about it is kind of a, an equilibrium. You know, we have the things that we have to deal with that are damaging uh, nervous tissue, right? Including just the ordinary products of metabolism. And then you have of the repair side of the equation. Well, the idea that I want to promote the most is that the fact that either side of the equilibrium can cause deterioration. So a reduc- an increase in the amount of damage, which can come from certain environmental factors, come from environmental mismatch, that can cause tissue deterioration, but by the same token, simply reducing repair, which one way to do so is by reducing uh, demands on the tissue, that also will lead to deterioration. And one of my worries is that just like if you were to just eat protein and not exercise your muscles, you're not going to lead to muscle growth, is that without a demand signal in the brain that many of these things that we do in order to sort of ameliorate or help the damage side won't be, in fact, impactful without repair signal. You kind of think of it as you have a a restaurant to run and, and you have all of the supplies and materials that are needed to run the restaurant. But you also need workers and the repair signal that comes from demands, you know, brings in the workers and, you know, the supply side is kind of dealing with the work that that Bredesen's doing and so forth is dealing with providing the what's needed to actually run the restaurant. But you need both. So I worry that there may or may even be, you know, things that we have done previously to compounds we've tested that may have worked in the context of, an, of a repair, repair signal, just like protein works for building muscle in the context of a demand signal in the muscles. So I think, we, I think we, it's important that we have both, that we recognize the importance of that particular context in treating cognitive decline and treating the major forms of dementia. Seems like a reasonable uh, position to me. And again, it's a very analogous, as you've alluded to, to what we see in skeletal muscle. Mm-hmm you know, the interaction between the catabolic and anabolic factors. Right. You know, they they both play a role. Right, they both matter. Both Mm -hmm. matter. So, looping back to something you talked about earlier, could you reiterate the importance of adults being engaged in things they're not very good at? And do you have any thoughts on how we could encourage and support people to boldly try to do things they're not good at. Yeah. I mean, I don't like doing things I'm not good at. <laughs> and so this is the great challenge. And, and uh, I know I've uh, in working with tens of thousands of people. I, I know that the older we get, the more we resist um, doing things. We're used to feeling, you know, that's the great thing about our brain is that we can develop mastery in so many different areas. So by adulthood, people are used to feeling mastery in most areas of their life. And so that's, I think, part of the natural inclination of resisting not feeling well, whereas uh, not feeling good at something. Whereas as kids, you know, that's just an ordinary part of life. And, you know, you're, you're fine with, uh, with struggling at stuff. But the, the important thing from the demand coupling idea and the demand driven decline theory is that the worse you are, the more cognitive effort that's required, the better it's going to be for the brain. Just like uh, we've talked about, you know, if you're just getting into resistance training, your biggest gains are going to be right there in the beginning. And interestingly, that idea about, you know, struggling and working, exercising to failure, we embrace with respect to our physical health, we think, oh, I've done it. You know, if I, if I work out as hard as I can and I'm exhausted and I f- do a set and I fail at a set, I've sent the strongest possible signal to my body, the strongest possible growth and repair signal. And so we're happy about that. And yet when we learn to failure, right, when we get up and we have a task that we struggle with and we reach a point where we're, we're struggling, we tend to feel frustration and disappointment, largely because we have an expectation of, of what we should happen rather than seeing the value in the effort itself. So if you view things, if you learning new complex things, new complex skills in this framework instead, you realize that, A, this, you know, the struggle is where you're getting the most benefits and that the worse you are at something, the more you're benefiting it because it's those early learning phase. And the, the nice thing about, you know, whereas, you know, resistant training is kind of one domain, any new domain of learning you hit and there are endless possibilities confers the same benefit. So you have opportunities to be a beginner and struggle throughout your life. You can continue to sort of this process 
indefinitely, really, with with mm-hmm. all its all that's available. But I talk a lot about this particular issue because I know the limiting factor for so many people is mindset and having this frame, uh, this flipping the frame on how they see failure in learning endeavors. The other thing, which is which is a key tenet of of Brain Joe, is framing what our purpose of practice is. It's not necessarily to get better right then and there. It's to send quality inputs to the brain that it then uses, you know, while we're sleeping to reorganize networks to make us better the next day. Mm -hmm. So you're really just trying to send in the best possible signal you can for it to work on. And it's still effort related. So that also frees people up of having expectations of what's supposed to happen during a practice session. It's really just putting forth Mm -hmm. the best possible effort. Yeah, I think you just said the magic word effort. I think it's effortfulness both in resistance training and perhaps Mm -hmm. in what you're talking about, learning. That's really, it's not the failure, it's the effortfulness. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. I don't like to fail. Right. Well, I I just mean when people hit the lim- find that limit of where they're right. you know so it is we with a sort of the deliberate practice idea you want to find that zone right. where you're just on the cusp of what you can that, do that's what i think is key yeah. yeah and um so people will interpret when you if you're if you're trying to find that limit you're going to have moments where you don't succeed where you fail you have to so if you so if you have to be willing to pursue to get mm-hmm. to that um, point and be okay with it you mm-hmm. you you will experience failure, but failure isn't the goal. It's the effortfulness it, that's it, the goal. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, makes sense. Well, in 2018, you launched the Intelligence Unshackled podcast, which explores the potential of human intelligence. And you cover a lot of ground in the podcast, and we'll make sure that we link to it in the show notes, just by the way. On the show's homepage, you point out that the human brain has far more potential than most people realize, and realizing that potential requires people to understand and address the ways in which our brains are limited or shackled. So what led you to enter the podcast world, and can you give us an overview of the show? Sure. So first of all, I love podcasts. That's that's uh, probably the main reason I, I first got into it. I've uh, been hooked on them for many years. I realized I had a lot of ideas and writings that were accumulating and I needed a, a way to get them out and a way to flesh them out as well. And I find podcasts to be a really good outlet for doing so. It's faster than writing a full article, but many of the same benefits. You're able to share, get ideas out in the world. You're able to refine them in your own mind. So they work both in terms of being able, uh, an efficient way of communicating. They also are good for the ideas that are in the podcast. We'll probably end up in a book soon. So they're a good way for sort of working on that process while still getting something in return for it. But the basic idea behind the Intelligence Unshackled podcast is that, like you said, I think that there's, um, we've only sort of scratched the surface in terms of what's possible with human intelligence. And one reason for that uh, are the existing constraints. So we can make improvements either by adding stuff or, you know, removing constraints to progress. So part of the, uh, the mission there is kind of identifying what those constraints are and what to do about them. And part of that is the sort of biological foundation of the brain, right, where many of our brains are finding themselves these days in suboptimal environments. So that's one big constraint, and that has to kind of do with the work I do as a, as a neurologist. But then there are other ideas around intelligence and kind of the conventional narrative of that and some ideas that that come largely from the field of neurology that I think can inform that discussion and um, reconfigure how we might think about the possibilities uh, with respect to human intelligence. And then it also, another constraint being the stuff that I'm doing with Brain Joe, which is attacking the, the fixed mindset and helping people understand the importance of process and then how we can take advantage of our brain's incredible ability to learn and adapt uh, throughout our lives and that the mindsets are a huge uh, constraint as well. And within all those things, there's tremendous potential to get a lot better than where we're at. But I think that it's important if we're trying to uh, improve human intelligence and the human experience to identify and understand where the existing constraints are on that process uh, and make sure we're addressing those. Hmm. And in your spare time, you also play tennis. I'm kind of laughing thinking about your spare time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what, what spare time would this guy have? <laughs> um, so is that something that you've always done or is it something that you took up later in life? And also, is that an activity that stretches our brains? So tennis is something I've been playing for a very long time. 
I played at Wesleyan and uh, still play to this day. And so it is an activity that stretches the brain. So one of the things I talked about uh, last night was the different sorts of activities that provide sort of a whole brain workout, which is if we're trying to provide the maximal stimulus to the brain, we want to try to activate and engage as much of our cortex as we can. And there I talked about music and dance being sort of the poster children for that. But sports and, and skill sports in particular also kind of meet a lot of those criteria. So tennis would be one of them. Now I'm at the somewhat disadvantage of having played it much of my life. So it's no longer sort of a novel learning domain, but there are elements, you know, there are strategic elements in tennis. It's a social game. You're always playing against a new opponent. So there's still sort of a cognitive workout that comes from it, even if you've um, been doing it for a while. So it's a great activity to, to stick with, but it's not one that uh, it's currently sort of in my new learning endeavors. I have to I have to think of something else to do besides tennis, but I enjoy it. There's many benefits beyond that that come from it, which is why I still do it. Makes sense. Um, I, I understand that another part of your daily routine is a walk with your wife. Is that right? Yes. So uh, we make a point to walk at least once a day during lockdown. And most of last year, we were doing one in the morning, one in the evening. And we, that's, our, that's our goal usually if we can get it in. But yeah, that's kind of one of those sacred things that we'll almost always get in if we can at least a half hour. And one of the other nice things about uh, the pandemic was that we discovered all these wonderful hiking trails near our house that we didn't know existed. So now we have even more wonderful places to go walk. Walking is one of the most unreasonably powerful things that we can do to uh, maintain health. In so many ways. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree. So I guess one of my takeaways from today's interview is that the key to a successful relationship is to first get married in a science museum, which is awesome, <laughs> and then take a walk every day with your wife. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yep. <laughs> A little birdie, and maybe it was a Georgia J, tells me that you and your family have a special musical tradition at Christmas. Could you elaborate on this a little bit? Was the birdie right? The, yeah, the birdie was right. Was that birdie named Tommy? By yeah, so it was, a, it was a Tommy bird, which is a special subspecies of uh, Georgia J. <laughs> right, right, right. In the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so yeah, so uh, years ago, um, when my, my kids were, I think, probably around f four and seven, so I have a boy and a girl, there was a uh, contest that was being held on a popular banjo site where you could submit a Christmas video, a Christmas song and video. And so we, you know, put put on costumes and did a video that year and submitted it. And then we decided, or I, I decided, uh, that we would make this a, a, a regular tradition in our house. So, so each holiday, most holiday seasons, uh, we've done this. We've taken a song and put on a little performance and, and dressed up in whatever you know, appropriate uh, attire for it. So that's been a, a recurring tradition. And, and the great thing is that if I were to, and I, I personally love it, and it's great to have these videos each year of, of, of us doing it. If I were to try to do this now, like having not done it with a with a uh, 14 and a 16 year old, there's no way. <laughs> no. I've done it. But because it's a tradition, I can rope them into doing it. So, um, <laughs> so it's 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 it's, uh, it's been great. It's it's something I'll I'll keep doing as long as they'll humor me. <laughs> it sounds pretty cool, actually. <laughs> yeah. Sounds very cool. Yeah. Well, Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a blast having you on the podcast. Thank you so much. Been great to be here. Absolutely. It was, uh, you did a great job last night and today too. Thanks so much. Stem talk. 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 So that was a really fun interview, Ken. And one of the most interesting points that Josh made today was about how Sinclair Lewis observed a hundred years ago that fasting helped him manage his chronic headaches. And as Josh said, fasting was quite popular in the U.S. back in Sinclair's day. And then we forgot about it and moved on to some other trend or fad. And it just shows that we humans have very short memories. But with the migraine miracle and also keto for migraine, I really think that Josh has hit upon a treatment that will stay around and help people manage their migraines for a long time. I agree, Don. This was indeed a fascinating interview. I also encourage listeners to visit IHMC's website to view the lecture that Josh gave at IHMC last night. It will also be on YouTube, and we'll be sure to include a link to that lecture in our show notes. And if you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Don Cornega signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. 
We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.